and today I will take up the new chapter, chapter 6, The Ascent of the Sacrifice, number 2. In the last three days, I have given you a gist of chapter 4 and 5 because they were connected with the same theme of sacrifice. So we have seen basically the concept of uh, sacrifice metaphysically and what do we do for surrendering and what is the role of the psychic surrender and what is the means of ethics and religion etc. So having given you this background, I would like to take up this chapter which is one of the most beautiful ones in this entire synthesis of yoga. In fact all these three chapters together form uh, I would say for, from the point of view of sadhana quite the essence of uh, Shravindu's yoga. And as you will see, these are chapters with a tremendous psychic touch, even the language, the poetry, the expression. I mean, you can always uh, see a reverberation of, a, of psychic uh, vibrations. In fact, if I am not too wrong, Mother herself had mentioned uh, that of all the books of Sri Aurobindo, it is this synthesis of yoga which has a psychic vibration. See like uh, if you would see the life divine, it has a completely different language and a vibration which is there more on the intellect and beyond intellect. But the synthesis is uh, definitely not only appealing to the psychic but the very language is uh, imbued with the psychic consciousness. So this chapter I will take up in detail and uh, yesterday I saw that if we take it up in detail I would require a minimum of 5 to 6 days which means that we may be going till 28th of this month, surely till 27th because I would like to add to this a lot of explanation that the mother has given on some of these uh, main ideas. So those of you who can pull on till 28th, you will see the end of the chapter because I definitely would not like to hurry because it is too good to skip any line. And then uh, the idea of uh, taking up chapter 7 which is the standards of conduct and spiritual freedom. I was planning to and hoping to take it up this time but obviously I cannot. But what I propose is uh, for the August Darshan talks. As I was telling you, I can take up uh, the first three days of August 12, 13, 14 for the exhibitions, not for the exhibition and seminar. And then after Darshan on the 16th, I may give only one day for the explanation of the book The Mother. And then we can continue with synthesis 16, 17, 18, 19, 20th uh, with this chapter that I was proposing to do. So although I had uh, mentioned a different program earlier, earlier, I think I would like to revise it to this so that we do not uh, miss our regular reading of the synthesis. So let us do it this way after Darshan, August Darshan from 16th or 17th onwards till about 20th or so or 22nd whatever the time needed, 
I will continue with uh, the synthesis. So, be prepared for in August for a long period of about 12th to 25th almost is a long, long time, almost uh, 12 days. But it will be the time dedicated to mother's uh, centenary arrival. As I told you, I would like to have some special programs here. And those of you who are here on March 29, do come. We will have some special program which I will announce in the ashram on the ashram notice board because that is the first day of the mother's uh, centenary arrival. So, uh, to begin with this chapter, the ascent of the sacrifice number two, the works of love, the works of life. It is therefore through the sacrifice of love, works and knowledge, with the psychic being as the leader and priest of the sacrifice, that life itself can be transformed into its own true spiritual figure. If the sacrifice of knowledge, rightly done, is easily the largest and purest offering we can bring to the highest, the sacrifice of love is not less demanded of us for our spiritual perfection. It is even more intense and rich in its singleness and can be made not less vast and pure. This pure wideness is brought into the intensity of the sacrifice of love when into all our activities there is poured the spirit <coughs> and power of a divine infinite joy and the whole atmosphere of our life is suffused with an engrossing adoration of the one who is the all and the highest. For then does the sacrifice of love attain its utter perfection. When offered to, the, offered to the divine all, it becomes integral, catholic and boundless. And when uplifted to the supreme, it ceases to be the weak, superficial and transient movement men call love and becomes a pure and grand and deep uniting ananda. You see, of course, we are going to get a greater explanation of all this, <coughs> but just to introduce the thought, you see, we have seen that the sacrifice of knowledge, that means through ethics or religion or, or, or morality and altruism, etc., all that is good, it has its own place, but this question of love, brings in an intensity to sadhana. You see, knowledge widens your mind, <coughs> mental consciousness you have. It brings you greater knowledge and width of the mental consciousness. But then, there is this intensity in sadhana which is brought about only by the element of love. So what exactly is this offering sacrifice of love? And this is something that we need to understand <coughs> a bit more closely because we have a lot of misunderstanding about this question of love because uh, that is where we are all stuck in our normal life our love for our children, for our spouses, for our parents, for our country, for our community. And we are kind of, you know, bogged down by all these things. So is it good or is it bad? Is it necessary or not necessary in yoga? And what is this question of love that Shri is going to describe? So there is, uh, as it says, one type where it says, when love offered to the divine all, it becomes integral, catholic and boundless. And when uplifted to the supreme, it ceases to be the weak, superficial and transient movement men call love. You see, already he is making a distinction between two kinds of love. One, the human love, 
the human attachments, human relations, which is by nature weak, superficial and transient. By nature, you cannot help it. You part with your friend, you part with your spouse, you have a problem, you have a quarrel with your relations, be it any kind of relation. You cannot much help it. Don't you don't have to run to a psychiatrist and say, hey, I got a marriage problem, I got a problem with my children, I got a problem with my parents. It is in the very intrinsic nature of human love to be transient, to be superficial, to be weak. So however much we may claim as I really love my child, my wife, my husband, it's all skin deep. You may have a bit of more sentiments, physically you may be attracted, related, but all that is transient. You see, the more if love is based on the physical attraction, then it is the shortest lived. That means the span of love is very short. From the physical, if you rise to the heart level, then it is longer. But the mental level also is not all that long. So the highest the, and, and the longest, not the highest, the longest span of love can last on the level of the heart. Both the physical and the mental don't last. Because you can imagine on the level of the mind, immediately your self-defense, the ego, your being right and the other person being wrong, the quarrels, they come up. Because mind's nature is to oppose, is to have this kind of a sense that I am right. So the intellectual love, as we say, cannot last long because by nature, the mind wants to divide. It doesn't want to unite. And a physical love, of course, you know, the moment your passions are saturated, it's gone. So the nearest we can come to a lasting love, love also lasting is the is a, is a wrong word, or a longer love perhaps if I can say, is the heart. But still all of them are weak, but it's only when we turn this human love towards the divine, that it becomes integral, catholic and boundless. So slowly we have to start, maybe as you would explain later, we have to start with the base of human love and then mount and then go up and then go beyond. So although it is a divine love for the supreme and universal divine, that must be the rule of our spiritual ex existence. This does not exclude altogether all forms of individual love or the ties that draw soul to soul in manifested existence. This is Shurabindo is again extremely clear that spiritual love or love for the divine does not exclude all forms of individual love or the ties that draw soul to soul. So this is the for, and love for the forms of individual love is that human relations. We have varied kind of forms of love. I mean, I don't have to mention, you know, all the types and the friends and the uncles and mamas and chachas and children and spouses, any kind, you can just give it a name. So this is all part, he says it does not exclude, exclude. if you just say, I love the divine, I love the mother, it doesn't mean that you really reject all that. Yes. There is a point of rejection, but it is all included. But now the, the tricky point is, at what point are all these different forms of love embraced by love for the divine? Is it in the beginning? Is it in the end? We will see that. A psychic change is demanded, a divestiture of the mass of the ignorance a purification of the egoistic, mental, vital and physical movements that prolong the old inferior consciousness. Each movement of love spiritualized must depend no longer on mental preference, vital passion or physical craving, but on the recognition of soul by soul, love restored to its fundamental spiritual and psychic essence with the mind, the vital, the physical as manifesting instruments 
and elements of that greater oneness. In this change the individual love also is converted by a natural heightening into a divine love. For the divine inhabitant immanent in a mind and soul and body occupied by the one in all creatures. Well, he is just, uh, I mean, uh, giving us an introduction. It's only later after the third paragraph that he takes it up in greater depth. But what is it that <coughs> that <coughs> that we get here? A psychic change is demanded. Each movement of love spiritualized. I mean, see, basically, it is a kind of a repetition of the same thing that all that love that is based on the mental, physical and vital unless and until it gets a psychic touch it will not last. If you remember some of you might have already seen the mother's uh, <coughs> card given to a new married couple. You see, it is a beautiful message where she would say, marriage of course brings union on the physical, then it should not remain only on the physical union, it has to go on the emotional, it has to go on the mental and then there must be a union on the psychic level, soul to soul. So unless and until, until one progresses in this union, the, the union will not last. The harmony will not be there. So mostly what happens in normal relations, we are between the physical and the, and the emotional. There's, there are very few cases where there is again a kind of a mental unity, a mental harmony. It is not the question of obeying each other, satisfying each other, that is not mental. That means on the level of the mind also, there is a kind of a great harmony. So one has to reach that, one should not say, no, nah, we are all right, we do not have any problems, we do not have quarrels, we live quietly. It may be a physical vital, but there has to be the higher union on the mental level too. It is only then that you can reach the spiritual or the psychic or the soul level. So a marriage when it comes to the level of that inner unity, that then it has a meaning then you help each other in sadhana, then only it is lasting. Otherwise, if you are stuck on the emotional and the physical, well, you can be sure things will not last too long. Well, now coming to the more details, here he brings out all love. Indeed, that is adoration has a spiritual force behind it. Even when it is offered ignorantly and to a limited object, Something of that splendor appears through the poverty of the right and the smallness of its issues. Now he is taking it to the depth of it. You see, what is this, this, uh, this feeling, this vibration of love? The scientist and the modernist would say it's only chemistry. Love is a, is a chemistry of the heart. There are some things happen in the body and then there is a, some, some secretion of some glands happens and then you fall in love, it is absolute nonsense. You know science has really degraded all these values even when they say soul is nothing but a, an, a, something belonging to the mind, it has no independent reality. But how do we see, how does Shri Aurobindo look at it? All love that is adoration has a spiritual force behind it. Now when it says all love that, that is adoration, now adoration of what? You see you may be, I will say, for love that is worship is at once an aspiration and a preparation. It can bring even within its small limits in its ignorance a glimpse of a still more or less blind and partial but surprising realization. For there are moments when it is not we, but the one who loves and is loved in us, and even a human passion can be uplifted and glorified by a slight glimpse of this infinite love and lover. You see, at the deepest level or at the highest level, whichever you want to take, 
all emotion of love. It may be very crude, it may be very physical, it may be very temporary. It has this, this truth that it is a divine love that is behind it. You see, we humans could not have had the feeling of love if the divine love itself was not there behind it. So the origin is always the divine love. Now you see it is like uh, she would explain, the mother would explain that when this divine love gets reflected in the physical or the emotional or the mental, it is just distorted because of our impurity, because of our narrowness, because of our limitation, because of our falsehood. Otherwise the vibration is the same. You see the same sunlight comes down on, on this entire earth. But it gets reflected in some waters, it does, when it falls on a rock it does not get reflected. When it is there in a flower it blooms, when it is there in dirty water it is there. So you see similarly it depends how we receive this divine love, on what level. That is why on every level the deflection, the perversion is different. On the physical it is different, it is very gross, it is violent even. And yet you may say, I love my spouse, I love my this, that, and having all the violence. So this is the perversion that takes place unfortunately and yet you think it's love. You beat your spouses, you have all the ill behavior, misbehavior, violent behavior. And yet you think, and yet there is an attachment. How does it happen? You see, we have seen hundreds of families where there is a marital violence as they say nowadays, marital rape or whatever. And yet spouses live together for long times, they bear each other, why? Because you see physically there may be this kind of a violence, but on the emotional level they are attached. So you see you have three different levels of love, the physical, the emotional vital and the mental. So one of them is keeping you together. That is why we are aghast to say, how is it possible that this couple is living so long together in spite of the marital violence. But that is happening on the physical. On the emotional, they keep together or maybe sometimes they are together on the mental level. So it is only when all the three levels break down, then you say, sorry, we can't live. So until that happens, the pair, the couple, they, they try to live on, live together. Because essentially there is a divine vibration. And you, you will see very interestingly, it is such a universal thing. How is it that every man and woman, the moment they reach their adolescence, they naturally go to that opposite sex? Naturally, nobody teaches them, beta and beta, you must fall in love, you must take a partner. It is a very natural thing. Why? Because he says here that it is, uh, it can bring even within its small limits in the ignorance a glimpse of a still more or less blind and partial but surprising realization, for they are moments when it is not we but the one who loves and is loved in us. So who loves and who is loved? It is the same one consciousness, the divine consciousness. You can sit here, excuse me. You see that is the whole beauty of this that there is only one person who loves, the divine. It is he who is seeing his own reflections in all these forms. So all this is, it is not the question of we loving and they loving and we quarreling. It is only one person, the divine seeing his reflections in all these human forms. Now the only thing is, how much, how purely do we reflect this divine love. But as I said, on each level there is a different deflection, deformation and that is the whole tragedy of human love. 
So otherwise he said the truth is, is only the one who loves and is loved in us and even a human passion can be uplifted and glorified by a slight glimpse of this infinite love and love. You see even when we have this human love between relations and children whatever, sometimes you know we feel great to be with our spouses or with our parents or with our children. Why? Because there is a glimpse of that divinity, of that purity. Why do we love the children most? Because they do not they don't have the perversion and the deflection. They reflect the divine life in such a pure manner, the physical, there is nothing of the mental, nothing of the vital, that his child, that the child's smile, it may be your child or any child, yesterday I was sitting for the darshan, the two children, very tiny tots, two years, three years. But the purity that they carry in their steps, in their smile, in their movements, you fall in love. And that is why all of us say, oh children are divine. In what sense? It is because they do not pervert or deflect the divine love. They catch it in its purity. So we always fall in love with children, whoever they are, because we see the touch of the divine there. So he would say here, it is he one who loves and is loved in us, in us. even a human passion can be lifted, uplifted because we see the infinite love and lover. It is for this reason that the worship of the God, the worship of the idol, the human magnet or ideal are not to be despised. For these are steps through which the human race moves towards that blissful passion and ecstasy of the infinite, which even in limiting it, they yet represent for our imperfect vision when we are still to use the inferior steps nature has hewn for our feet and admit the stages of our progress. You see, this is the as I told you before, that one who cannot even love man or the, have the human relation is not ready to turn to the divine. See these human relations, be it what? He gives you examples that uh, it could be the worship of a god, fine, and any god. It does not have to be Brahman and Satchitananda and Krishna and Christ and Rama and Krishna. It can be a Muthalama there, right in my street we have a temple called Muthalama, a goddess. But you know as I was telling you on 25th there will be 100 gods here and there will be 10,000 people walking here. What, what for? Because they have faith and love for this divine called the Muthalama, for them she is a great goddess with a divinity, does not matter. And we cannot, as it says here, despise saying, oh, you know, we ashramites are better, we go to the samadhi, we go to the, so in the mother's room, yesterday we went, and on day after tomorrow, 25th, you know, there will be 100 people eating and drinking, not drinking, but you know, shouting and making halabalu. And so we should never ever think that we are anyway greater than any one of these people. See, for God's sake, because I am telling this, a lot of Aurobindonians think themselves to be quite up collared saying, we are devotees of Mother and Shoribindo, they are devotees of. There is always a kind of a seesaw thinking that I am higher just because they are there doing this way. Never ever think. Because for everyone, for everybody, these are steps. So worship of a god, worship of the idol, you see the idol worship, many religions do not believe in idol, idol worship, but we Hindu, we have tremendous, I mean this idol worship is, is part of our daily culture. So even that, the human magnet or ideal. You see, we go to a guru or we, we spend our life or we give our life to an ideal. 
So, all these are important and have their place in, in where? In your individual evolution. So, that is why he is saying that for these are steps through which the human race moves towards that blissful passion and ecstasy. So, we have all to begin with something or the other. You may be worshipping an idol and you may be worshipping an ideal, you, should, you may be worshipping a human magnet. What we are, do we not say in India, the great human magnet could be a cricketer, could be a film star. But this, this gesture of adoring someone else, it could be a fallacy, it could be a stupid thing. But this gesture of moving out instead of adoring yourself and your ego and your, your yourself, your, your false self, at least you move out of yourself and say, oh, he is great. The recognition of the greatness in the other itself is a first step outward and forward. And he would say then that these are steps with which a human race moves forward. But here there is an evolutionary movement, a movement that begins in adoration out of fear, must move towards an adoration out of love. That is the only difference. You see, you may adore a god or a goddess or as you said an idol worship, but is it through fear? Fear of God's punishment? Then as Shravinda would describe in the later chapters, then the, the level of your worship, your love for the divine is on a very low crude level, although it could be a beginning. But fear of God is the lowest measure of your love for the divine. When you come out of the fear of God, you slowly move up and when you begin to be a friend of God, perhaps next stage, what the relation was between Arjuna and Krishna and intimacy with the divine, you do not fear, but you are friends. Then the third level could be the mother, when the divine becomes your mother. And the highest level is when the divine is the, your lover. The best and the highest relation is when you and the divine become the lover and the love beloved. So how many of us can do that? Are we still afraid of mother and Shwabhan though? Oh, they will punish us if I don't go to the darshan, kiyo ho be, punishment. Agar ye idea aap, aap, mind maaya, you are on the very crude level. So let us never be afraid because that the fear keeps you away from the mother. There is a barrier created by the, this question of fear. And if you say, mother is going to punish me, Shwabhan is going to punish me, if I don't do that, you know, I have been going to Samadhi yesterday, Day before also I did not go, for the last one week I did not go, I missed my darshan yesterday. If there is fear, then you are bringing back religion. All these efforts of Sri to make a, to bring spirituality is lost. Because fear is the basis of all religion. So if you bring any ayata of religion of fear into spirituality of Sri and the mother, we are converting mother and Sri into a religion. And that is the worst service we can do to Mother and Sri So, if you want to serve the Mother and Sri Aurobindo, the first thing that we have to work upon ourselves is not to be afraid. Because Mother and Sri Aurobindo are not here to punish us for our wrongdoing, so called sin. There is nothing called sin. So, these are the things that st still color our thinking. But for heaven's sake, please take out the element of fear in our relations with the mother and Shwabindo, because that is the, the, the evolution of human love for the divine. Starts with fear, comes up to the level of next level that Shwabindo describes is the, is the judge, the father in heaven. 
So that is you know that he will be punishing us, the father in heaven. Then we come to the level of the friendship. Next we come to the level of the mother. The highest we come to the level of the lover and the beloved. That's why we admire so much Radha. That's why we admire so much Mera, Mirabai. Because they had achieved this kind of a lover and the beloved. A human Mirabai and a Krishna, she says, he is my beloved, he is my Purusha, he is my husband. So it may seem crude, but that is the highest relation of the soul. That is exactly where there is a soul relation. When you are the lover and the beloved, it's a pure soul relation. That's why Radha and Krishna, Krishna may have all his wives, 16,000 wives, and nobody was ever having that kind of a relation of Radha. So Radha did not need Krishna on the physical level. That's why she was away all the time, pining away. But Sri Krishna would always hunger for the companionship of Radha, but that is the soul relation. So this is the progress of evolution of love, of worship. Now we come to the next line where he says, that certain in idolatries are indispensable for the development of our emotional being, nor will the man who knew, who knows the hasty, I'm sorry, who knows be hasty at any time to shatter the image unless you can replace it in the heart of the worshipper by the reality it figures. Moreover, they have this power because there is always something in them that is greater than their forms and even when we reach the supreme worship that abides and becomes a prolongation of it or a part of its catholic wholeness. So this is a warning and I think we could really pay attention to that. <coughs> Certain idolatries are indispensable for the development of our emotional being. <coughs> idolatries means worship of an idol, be it of Krishna or Christ or Rama or anybody. Idol, it does not mean you have to make a murti out of stone or out of marble. This could be just a photograph. That is also an idolatry. So you worship the photograph, you worship a statue, you worship an image, you worship the painting, it's fine. Because as all of you know, this photograph is not just an image caught by a camera, the photographs of Mother Shurban. She says, I am there in every photograph. And you have seen yesterday's photo, it was a very rare photo, them, what we got in the message. A very beautiful photo. But really when you look at the mother, you have a different kind of a response in yourself. Because in each photo she says, I am a different person. So she has put different consciousness in each photograph. So she did not pose for a photo. When she was clicked, a, a, a different aspect of her being came to the photograph. So she says, all of you don't like necessarily this photograph or maybe this photograph. Each one of us we have kept in the meditation, in our own meditation rooms or in my bedrooms or study rooms, a different photograph that you have liked. Because you have that kind of a rapport with that aspect of the mother. That is one of the reasons why I suppose she allowed herself to be photographed because there could be a million rupas, a million forms, a thousand forms of the mother and there could be a million people wanting these different forms of the mother. I mean that is the essential truth of this so called 33,000 gods in Indian mythology. Why did we have 33,000 gods? Because there are 33,000 million people who look at God differently. So God says I will come to you exactly as you want me to be. You want me to be like that, you want me to be like this, you want me to be like that. And some people you know, I've seen in Tamil Nadu taking mother's eyes. I mean great many shops here have those fearful eyes of the mother, the Kali's eyes. But a lot of people like that, I don't like it personally. 
Why is, is the same mother's eyes? But there is a different force, a different consciousness that attracts you and your soul. So we see the mother, here Shwabinda says, idolatries are indispensable for the development of our emotional being. Nor will the man who knows be hasty at any time to shatter the image unless he can replace it in the heart by the worshipper of the reality it figures. So we cannot, uh, should not say, oh now I don't need a mother's photographs because there are some people, I mean uh, individuals, west or east, they say I don't need a mother's pictures in my room. I don't need this statue of Christ or Krishna or Rama. You see, they think it, it, it is to be modern. It is to be non-religious. That if you worship this, go into the temple and put the mother's photo or this, it becomes religious. They will say, hey, we are doing like any other person. But you see, it, spirituality is a very natural progress. The, 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 the pull of your soul to the divine. And this pull of the soul, it can take many shapes, many forms. So I'm afraid nowadays we can't even tell a person, don't do that or do this, put a photograph, don't do. There's no don't because if you say, Mr. Reddy, you see, this is why, what is helping me, finish. I have no word to say that. Helping you in what? To grow towards the mother? By all means. So if I say don't, immediately a religion is coming. So the mother has given such a great freedom, but freedom dot dot dot, freedom to do what? Not to do whatever you like, freedom to grow spiritually. So please remember the word freedom goes with the other attached word to grow spiritually. That is where the full freedom is given. If you want to grow egoistically, grow economically, grow on the level of power, she says, I am not with you. If you want to grow spiritually, you have the full freedom. But if you are misusing the freedom and say, I am you are going to become more and more powerful in my institution, I will become the chairperson, blah, 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 then that is not the right thing. So these are beautiful sentences which tell us that these are steps going towards higher thing. And until and unless we have the, he says, uh, uh, until we replace it in the heart of the worshipper by the reality it figures. You see there are some sadhaks in the ashram who did not go to samadhi for months together, for years together. They were not less faithful to the mother. But if they have realized the mother within themselves, all the outer gestures are not necessary. You see, this is the beauty of religion and spirituality. Religion depends on outer gestures, outer formulations, outer worship, outer creed. But spirituality always, it may start with religion, but the moment you realize your inner being, nothing of the outer is required. You don't have to come for 21st February, you don't have to come for 15th of August. You can be in your house, in your room, just sit down on this day and think of the Lord and you will see them in front of you. So all these outer gestures that we do still show us that we are dependent on this. So in the beginning when I saw those ashramites not going to the samadhi, I used to think, hey, why are they, not, why are they doing like that? I felt a bit hurt that being here, we don't go to samadhi, how come? And then later I realized that if you have captured the psychic being within, the mother is always beside you. Because after all, why do you want to go to samadhi or this room or that room? To feel that jhalak, to feel that touch, to feel that the greatness of the presence. But once you are a psychic being, you have the presence all around you, at all times. Not only on 21st February with token time 2.30 to 3.30. And I am sure nobody got from 2.30 to 3.30, you have to stand 4 hours in the line. 
And by then, I don't know how many people had this aspiration to see the mother's room. All the aspiration, chota mota kam ho jata is that, yaar, dhur mein khade hain chaar ganta. In the beginning, you had great aspiration, I'm going to mother's room, put on nice dress. But with all the sweat of the sun, at do baje, teen baje, your aspiration goes down, sweats down. So it is necessary that we have to move within. Let us not be dependent, as mothers would say, it's a beginning step. It's beautiful, it says, when we have still to use the inferior steps, nature has hewn for our feet and admit the stages of our progress. Long back, I had asked this question to Champaklaji, that are we not making sure even though into a religion? Because he was the right person to ask. I said, in darshan, we go, we do this, we do this. Champaklaji, I feel. Uh, and uh, different with a religion, with a religion with a different name and form and robe. He said, Anand, all these are steps on the way. Because man cannot be asked to jump to spirituality overnight. It may be Shravabindo or it may be Ramakrishna, it may be anybody. Every one of us, we have to move. We need to go to the Samadhi, we need to go to Shravabindo's room, we need to go to Mother's room, we need to come to Pondicherry. As long as we do not come, go within and see the reality, it figures. Because behind this photo, there is a true Aditi consciousness or that Aditi consciousness which in us is represented by the psychic being. So unless and until we realize that, he says let us not throw out, throw away the baby with the bath water. So as long as we need the external support, I need a ladder to climb up. But once I am on the top of the roof, then I do not need a ladder. But Taktata Zarrat hai. So let us not act smart and say, hey, I am becoming spiritual and if you kick the ladder in, in the middle, you will fall down. As you say in Hindi, gharkana ghatka. You are neither on the roof, on the top of the roof nor on the ground. You are hanging midway and you may be hurt. So I am telling this because there is a possibility of hypocrisy coming in. You want to show yourself to be a great spiritual man. I am a practitioner of integral yoga, I don't need the ladder. Don't do this any false thing. When it comes, it comes automatically, naturally, spontaneously. You will not have to declare anything, it's very natural. When you feel within, now I don't need the outer. So until then you keep moving, because these are the preliminary steps that nature herself has created for us. And then it says, our knowledge is still imperfect in us, love incomplete, if even when we know that that which surpasses all forms and manifestations, we cannot still accept the divine in creature and object, in man, in the kind, in the animal, in the tree, in the flower, in the work of our hands, in the, in the nature force, which is then no longer to us the blind action of a material machinery, but a face and power of the universal Shakti. For in these things too is the presence of the eternal. You see, this is the, of course, the, he throws an idea which will develop in the next para. You see, when we say all that we love the divine, I mean, It's so difficult, you know, I mean, we use this word so loosely, glibly, as you say. I love the mother, I love Shravabindo, I love God. In Hindi, it is said, it's a bade bade baate hai. Do you really love the divine? Do you know what the divine is? Ah, for me, you say, she is the divine, he is the divine. So you really love them? Now it's for you to analyze. When you say you love your wife or child or husband, what do you do? 
Let us put the example to a low, I mean our own human level. When you love your husband, when you love your wife, do you just say, hey I love you darling, that is a western style, honey I love you. But is it just saying or doing something? You have to express, manifest your love. Again, husband wife would say, hey, you keep on telling that what the hell are you doing for me? So, doing for me, that is what the divine also will say. You keep uttering, I love the mother, I love the mother. What are you doing for the mother? So, keep that hint. Just do not keep saying, I love the mother, I am Ekanesh, I am Bhaloparshi, I am. Coming to the Pondicherry ashram for darshan is not showing a love to the mother. I mean, I am sorry, I am a bit blunt, but I want to go through this end of, end of this road, you know. Because I want to break this notion, say, I love the mother and Tompi, there we are. But go and tell your wife that I love you, but I will just keep quiet, I will not go to the office, bring you money and your wife says, I love you, but I will not eat food for three times. So, see what happens. So, you see, we all expect each other to do something to express our love. That is there on the human level. The same thing on the divine level too. We need to do, we need to first of all do and then we need to become. You see, with the divine relation, this is the difference. We not only do for the divine, but become divine natured. That is the secret of the thing. You cannot work for the divine being fully, wholly, terribly human. Understand? If you want to really do for the divine, you have to elevate your consciousness, you have to transform your mind, you have to purify your vital, then only you can properly do. In the beginning you may say, okay, Mother, I am incapable, this is my defect, this is my problem, this, fine. Mother says, Tompi, I take you as you are. But then being what I am, I can do the only cooking for you, okay. I can do embroidery for you only, okay. But doing these things have you become something. And can you do this more? Can you do this better? It is not embroidering five saris and then I say, Mother, now next month I will do six saris. It is not the increasing the number of saris of embroidery that you show to the mother. Because it is those five saris had to be more and more perfected. That is the word. Each work has to be more and more perfected. It is not increased in number. So, how can you perfect your work? by a raise, rise in your consciousness. So, this is the secret of the divine work that you have to do for the divine and then become divine nature, become more and more perfect. That means increase your capacity. If you say my production line is only 5 saris a day or a month, that is not accepted. You have to do better, you have to bring in greater perfection and then the moment you say you have to bring in greater perfection, whole sadhana comes in. The word perfection is a very, very difficult word, you know. How will you perfect a thing? You will say, I can bring more people, more instruments, no. You can perfect a thing by, by, by increasing, improving your own instrumentality, your mind, life and body. So, ye jo baat hai, you have to perfect. So, by more and more perfection, you can do for the divine. And that is the difference here, you would say that another thing, when I say I love the mother, I said you cannot love the mother unless and until you do something for the mother. Do something for the mother will ultimately lead you to do everything for the mother. 
So from something to everything that is the progression. That is what is sadhana. And then one of the most harmful things in this question of loving the mother, loving the divine, is like telling, you know, you know, in English we say, you know, if I love you, I have to love your dog also. Same thing with the divine. I mean, this is what we forget. That I love only Mother and Shwabindu. I don't love this Mutya Lama, I don't love this Christ, I don't like this Krishna, I don't like that Guru, and I don't like this person, I don't like that person, I don't like this country. He's a Simple rule is English, if I love you, I have to love your dog. Applicable to spirituality. So Shwabindu says, if you love the divine, you have to love his creatures, you have to love his objects, you have to love his animals, you have to love the tree, you have to love the flower. Why? Because all this is him. If I love you, I, I don't love your dog, you see your, your, the lady will kick you out of the house. And that is, I mean, it's so simple and yet it's so fantastic. Then I feel how small we are. And that's why I feel I cannot dare say, mother, I love you. If I do I love all of you here equally? Then how do I love the how do I claim that I love the mother? Because you Gujarat Sahib, Baroda Sahib, Kolkata Sahib, 21st I flew in, you think mother has seen your ticket and said, better, you love me more than anybody? You have to love, as he says, every in creature and object in man, in the kind, in the animal, in the trees, in the flower, in the work of our hands, in the work. He has given a whole galaxy of things. That means what? If you say, I love the divine, you also love the divine's creation. Until and unless you love the creation, you cannot love the divine. You love the creation means no Hindu, no Muslim, no Christian, there is no problem, there is no division. No backward class, no forward class, no Brahmin, no this thing, there is no division. No mine and no yours. If you can do that, even you can say that, that proves that you really love the divine. Not just keep the mother's photo and put an agarbati and mala and say. So I am just trying to analyze, it is not that I do, and I just want to understand, love the divine, it is so difficult. If Nalnida could say, I love the mother, that means he was not speaking the untruth. That means he, he could love everybody equally. He could love the cat and the rat and this person and that person. So what does it mean what Sri Krishna said? The equanimity. So you see, loving the mother, loving the divine are so many other qualifications. You have to be equanimous in your attitude. You have to be perfection in your work. You have got to be wide-minded. You have got to have a pure heart. So don't think love the mother is, or the love the mother, love the, love the divine is so simple. That because I do the meditation three hours a day and then I do pula mala four hours, four times a day. That's all religious. But one thing is, all this is preparation. Shri will not say don't do. It's all a preparation, but let us be very real, very clear that loving the divine is to love equally the divine creation. An ultimate inexpressible adoration offered by us to the transcendent, to the highest, to the ineffable is yet no complete worship if it is not offered to him wherever he manifests or, where, or wherever even he hides his Godhead in man and object and every creature. That's why I said this, this paragraph, this chapter is extraordinary. I mean, aap logo sadhana karna hai, janna hai, kya cheez hai ma, mother sand show the sadhana. Read these three chapters, supreme. You see, it says this devotion to the highest, to the transcendent is incomplete. If it is not offered to him, wherever he manifests. So, where does God manifest? 
in everything, the little flower, the little stone, the little man, the little pariah, the little beggar, the little Pakistani, the little Hindustani. But apna dil pe chuke dekho, how much of hatred I have, how much of division I have, how much. So he is a backward class, I hate him, he is that, he is Brahmin, he is not. You have so much of hatred and still you say, I love God. You are the greatest hypocrite and a liar if you say I love God, keeping all these divisions in your heart. So, what is the purification? I mean, I am feeling more and more ashamed to say that really I love God. Once you know the meaning of what is to love God, you cannot claim. We are all great claiming saying, I love the mother, I am a devotee of the mother, I am a devotee of Shwabindu. So now you see what it means, what a big lie we are telling. Because he says, can you really offer to him, to the divine, wherever he manifests or wherever even he hides his Godhead? Because in the ugly and the dirty and the, and the, and the pariah, he hides himself. You have to love that, you have to love, love the other human, you have to other, love the other religion, you have to love, love the creature, the flower, the little animal. So, in 1973, the last message that, Shur, that the mother gave in the, on the 1st January, I don't remember the exact words, she it says, it's only when you love the world and the divine at the same time equally, then you love the divine then you truly love the divine. This is exactly what this means. Let us not, let us be humble and just tell Ma, I have a very limited love for you, a very small reflection. Let us not claim for heaven's sake to be great devotees of the mother or Shwabindu or this God or that God. Because to love God is to love his creatures, to love his manifestation wherever he manifests or wherever he hides, in man and object and every creature. Extraordinary. Can you love every creature, every object? Nay, my Hindu, I Hindu gods, I love him, not a Muslim god. Then it's very incomplete, it's very narrow, it's religious. That's why it's so difficult to be spiritual. Religion is easier. You have your own God, your own Allah, your own Christ, your own Krishna. You have a very narrow view of things and that is religion. But the moment your, your, your cups from your eyes are open with spirituality, then you see everybody. You see everybody, you see everything. So this narrowed vision of one God, one Guru, one Master, one Avatar, suddenly you become so universal. Tab you say, sorry, I am not ready. My Hindu, Hindu, who my Hindu, I am God will say, thank you. Then you come, come to me next life. I will wait for you. And those who want to be a cutter Hindus, I can tell, I can tell you, you will be a cutter Muslim fellow next life or a, a cutter Christian next life. Just to have a laugh at you to say, hey, kya hua tha? Last life you were saying you are a cutter Hindu and now you are a cutter Muslim and you are a cutter uh, Christian. So mother says, soul doesn't have a religion. So why are you people becoming so fundamentalist about my religion, my this thing? Who is that mind? The soul is not saying, it's a damn mind. So she says, why should you have religious antagonism when the soul itself doesn't recognize? Because next life it will be a Muslim, next life it will be a Christian, next life it will be a Sikh. It will... Because for her, for the soul it has no problem, no meaning. It's we people who create this religion and then say my religion is greater than thine because mine is Vedas 15,000 years, Christianity is 2,222 years, Islam is 7. What is greatness about it? The moment you say I am greater than thine, the thou, you can be 100% sure you are speaking absolute lie. Because the moment you realize your psychic being, you cannot say I am greater than you. Simple. That itself shows that damn it, you have nothing to do with spirituality. You have only a mental, vital understanding of things. So you compare, you contrast, you are greater. You are. 
but a rishi, a sadhak, one who realizes, I, I remember Sri Ramakrishna always whenever I speak about this, he said, uh, all this noise that we make is like the Brahmari, what is Brahmari? It's like a bumblebee. Which goes from flower to flower and makes a lot of noise, you know, it goes. But when it sits on one flower and sucks the honey, the noise is stopped. It doesn't make noise anymore because it's sucking honey. So if we really suck the honey of our soul, all these questions, all these debates, all these seminars, all this book reading, nothing will matter. No religion, no caste, no country, nothing is important. Because that is the divine nectar. The soul is the divine nectar, which when you start tasting, all the questions of the mind are gone, all the emotional antagonisms vanish, all the divisions of mankind do not exist. So he says, try to drink the honey of the soul. So sure the two is telling us, an ignorance is there, no doubt, which imprisons the heart, distorts its feelings, obscures the significance of its offering. All partial worship, all religion which erects a mental or a physical idol is tempted to veil and protect the truth in it by a certain cloak of ignorance and easily loses the truth in its image. But the pride of exclusive knowledge is also a limitation and a barrier. So here we have an ignorance is there, no doubt, which imprisons the heart, distorts the feeling, etc. You see, that's what we are saying. We are so ignorant, so much in falsehood that we create our own barriers. My religion, my caste, my family, my name, my property, everything is mine. He says all this physical, mental is tempted to veil and protect the truth in it by a certain cloak of ignorance. You see, we are so pervertly clever that I start protecting the Vedas, protecting the Bible, protecting the Quran by building churches, by building this, uh, this, the saints around it, by building the priests and the popes around it. Because I want to secure and say, this is mine, this is great, this is my religion. This is all, this is ignorance and it easily loses the truth in its image. You see, while you are protecting, while you are making a church out of your teachings, you have lost the experience. So it is sometimes dangerous, I feel, even to speak about your own religion. Because speaking about your religion, what are you trying to do? You are trying to show it is greater than the others. You are trying to show how good it is. But uh, somebody like Ramakrishna or Ramana, they didn't compare Hinduism to Islam and Islam to Christianity. One who realizes the Brahman or the divine consciousness, they don't compare, they don't protect. Ramakrishna did not protect Vedanta. Whoever asked him questions, he just gave simple answers from his own experience. In fact, Ramakrishna went to the extent of saying, becoming a Christian, becoming a Muslim, becoming all these things to show that all are the same. So Shavandu says, behind all this, we try to protect out of ignorance. So becoming overzealous about our religion is absolute ignorance. So friends, you see, coming to Shravinda is not so easy. Maybe a little exaggerated. Because I don't want us to suffer this illusion that I have come to Mother and Shravindo, so I am a white collar devotee. The demand of Mother and Shravindo is extraordinary. It's much easier to go to another guru, another master who will say, Ye karo, wo karo, don't do this, don't do this. But here is a master who demands a width as high, as wide as the oceans. 
a height as high as the skies, a depth as high as, as deep as the soul. So, tabi aap log hum kaya sakta hai ke we are devotees of Madhya Shura. Otherwise, it's just a religiosity, darshan ke ja rahe hai, upar ja rahe hai, niche ja rahe hai. Yesterday I heard somebody in conversation, kya ho gaya aaj ka? Ho gaya. Kya ho gaya? Room ja kar raha as if the whole meaning of 21st February was to go to room. Is that why you came all the way from Bangalore and Baroda and Calcutta and Delhi? Ho gaya. Bas khushi aaj ho gaya. But kya hua darshan hua ki nahi? Room ka, room ja kar raha bas. You see ultimately if you pin down to that kind of a room darshan ho gaya. Room ko dekha hai, but are we here to have a room darshan or Sri Aurobindo darshan? So you see how we forget the whole thing. Instead of having Sri Aurobindo darshan, we have the room darshan. So what I'm telling you is nothing good or bad, not criticizing, but I want to awaken this in ourselves. Let us not be bound by this external paraphernalia. Please be for a moment at the inner darshan. There, there is a room, there, there is a Lord, there, there is, you will see the Lord in the room, not just room. <coughs> that is the real significance of the room. I said, I said, I said, I said, I said, I said, you lose all, all aspiration. But really sit wherever you are quietly and have the real darshan within. And if you can do that every day, every day will be 21st February. That's what the mother explains. Their birth is an eternal birth. Saal mein ek aane ka cheez nahi hai. If we can have a real darshan every day, that is to be an Aurobindonian. Not on 21st and 15th of December, August. So we will uh, <coughs> take up from this chapter, The Ascent of the Sacrifice, in my book it is 144 page. So we have seen trying to protect our religion, we are only trying to, we will be only narrowing it down because we would be missing the experience. And then he brings in a new thought. For there is concealed behind individual love, obscured by its ignorant human figure, a mystery which the mind cannot seize, the mystery of the body of the divine, the secret of a mystic form of the infinite, which we can approach only through the ecstasy of the heart and the passion of the pure and sublimated sense and its attraction which is the call of the divine flute player. The mastering compulsion of the all beautiful can only be seized and seizes through an occult love and yearning which in the end makes one the form and the formless and identifies spirit and matter. It is that which the spirit in love is seeking here in the darkness of the ignorance. And it is that which it finds when individual human love is changed into the love of the immanent divine incarnate in the material universe. <coughs> See, we're talking about the individual love, He says, behind each individual love, every individual love, there is a mystery which the mind cannot seize, the mystery of the body of the divine. You see, if you really start thinking, why is it that we get attracted to some people, why is it that there is 
a question of uh, loving each other in any form and every form. The real answer to this is that it is one divine, it is the supreme divine who has himself taken all these forms, be it from an earthworm to the man or to the, Him to the Himalayan mountains. It is he who has become all this. As we say, the multiplicity, the creation is only he. So it is each of these forms of the divine which are getting attracted to another form of the divine. You see, if there is no divine element of love within human being, we will never be attracted to each other. You may say, why vitally I am attracted to the person, why physically I like that person, she is beautiful or he is handsome and all that. Well, even this element of attraction itself is a form of love, a form of love on the vital level. See in his book, The Life Divine, he has a beautiful analysis. He says, even this question of hunger, the tiger eats the deer. I mean, you have seen on the National Geographic how it hunts and the lion eating something, the lion or the tiger or the fox. In, in one case, I think if I remember, mother was narrating about a, a tiger eating a lion. So we may see it to be something cruel, you know, it rips open its neck and then it kills it and there is bloodshed and all that. But then it says it is its extreme form of love. The lion's love for the deer or the tiger's love for the deer. Because you see, what Shravananda explains is, on the level of matter, the physical, love is express, expressed by hunger. The name of love on the physical level is hunger. You see, I take food, we all take food. And when, when we take food, we feel happy. Not only say, I got my stomach full, you feel satisfied, you feel happy. So there is this element of love which has come into you through the form, in the form of food. So there is a morsel of happiness that is going into the mouth, into the body. And this love and happiness and joy and they are all interconnected. So on the physical level, there is this question of one being eaten by the other, that is a physically one gets into the mouth and the stomach of the other. It may be you are taking a fruit or a banana or an apple or you are a non-vegetarian taking fish and chicken. Anything that enters the mouth is a form of physical love. It is the same supreme love known as hunger now. When it comes to the level of the vital, there is the same ananda, there is the same supreme divine love. But now it is known as desire vital desire, that means attraction to each other on a vital level. And this attraction to each other takes the form of passion, takes the form of desire, takes the form of possession. You see, what is the, what is the meaning of possession? It is exactly the same thing as hunger, but on the vital level. On the physical level, I have taken it into my mouth, I have absorbed it. On the vital level, again I want to take it in my mouth, but physically I cannot. So I possess. I possess the other person. Be it a child or your spouse or anybody, I possess. Like we have desire for money. It is all a possession. But that is another form of the same love or ananda. But you see, it is higher than hunger. 
it becomes something subtle. But the sense of possession, you see, belonging, like I say, if the food I have taken belongs to my body, it is in my stomach. So, when I desire somebody, I am also subtly on the vital level, I am eating up the person. That is where relations get bad. Because you are eating up the other person so badly that you are squeezing out and the person, the other person cannot breathe. So then you say, oh my God, you are possessing me too much. You are over possessive. I cannot live with you. When you feel cramped and suffocated, that is why we say the relations between the spouses must be free. There is no question of sense of possession. The moment there is a possession, there is a suffocation. So that is again a perverted shape, form of love or ananda. Then on the mental level, the same will is there, the same love is there, I am sorry, the same love is there, the same joy is there, ananda is there. But that is expressed as will, willpower. That means when I say I want to do certain thing, when I have decided that I will take it up, I will take up this course, I will do it. You are applying a will, that means again you want to take it up, you want to possess it, but on the mental thought level, the position is the will, where there is a force, where you apply. But at the same time, the better part on the mental le level is the, for the first time there is something called love. So let us call hunger, desire and on the mental level, love. What is the difference is love between love and desire and possession and hunger? On the physical level, you have taken it in. On the vital level, you are taking it in. Possession, holding. But on the mental level, when there is a love, you start giving. Instead of taking, you start giving. So, for the first time, the movement of ananda is reversed. Instead of bringing it in towards you, on the mental level, you start giving. So, if a relation does not move from the physical, from the vital to that of mental, love can never mature. If you are there only on the vital and the physical level, you are constantly wanting to grab, possess, squeeze the person. And so such a love can never last, such a relation can never last. Because you want to have physically, vitally, you know, if there is such an imbalance, such a such a, I mean, almost a suicidal thing. Be it the spouse or the wife or the husband or the children. If you start possessing the children, they will revolt say, no, Papa, I'm sorry. I don't want to obey you anymore. You are too much possessive. You are telling me too many things. So this over-possessiveness of children also is dangerous. So anywhere, now first time when you start loving, start giving. And that gesture of giving is completely different because instead of taking in, you take out. But on the mental level also, love is not pure, it does not give for the sake of giving. It is not a selfless love, Sri so says it is a selfish love. You want to give. But in return, I want to receive, you expect. There is no selflessness. I am doing for you, but you also want to give me my birthday. What you want to give me, you can go to the internet. You can go to the internet and find out. But on my birthday, if I don't get, then I say, I spent so many 5,000 rupees on her birthday, I don't get anything. You may not have told your wife, but there is an expectation. That's why this love on the mental level, level is selfish. He may show all the greatness saying, take your wife to a supermarket, take your jewelry, saris and all that. But within the parenthesis is, my birthday is next month, take care of, huh? something has to be. In short, Sri Aurobindo Paul says, love but a selfish love. And there again because 
and then he puts it very beautifully. He says, not only it is selfish, why the mental love also gets a little perverted and, and gets a shortcut? It's because I want to be loved the way I, I want to I want to be loved the way I want. So say I gave you so much, I gave you so much energy, blah blah blah, all the quarrels you know in the world. So that is called the selfish love. On the spiritual level, this love for the first time becomes aspiration and surrender. So the meaning of surrender, what you are doing, you understand again. You cannot surrender on the physical, vital, mental love. Even to the divine, we all go to Tirupati. Is it out of bhakti? I doubt. You all want to get back things from him. So there's purely mental love. Where is pure devotion on that? There's no surrender and devotion. So if there is a matter of surrender and devotion, it comes on the psychic or the spiritual level. So even if you want to love the divine, truly you have to become spiritual. Any other level, you demand something, you want to get something from the divine. So you would say, all these are steps on the way. So it's a love that is hunger, love that is desire, love that is self-love, love that becomes surrender. So now you see in this order where surrender comes, it comes on the spiritual level. But in the beginning we may have to practice on the mentally, physically, it's all practice. So he puts us here that there is the there is the attraction of one for the other because this one divine body getting attracted to the other divine body. But this attraction has different levels. So ultimately he says we have this uh, it's attraction which is the call of the divine flute player, the mastering compulsion of the all beautiful. So when it comes to the spiritual level you are attracted to the flute player, the call of the flute, the real divine voice within. So you are attracted inwardly for the flute player, can only be seized and seized us through an occult love and yearning which in the end makes one the form and the formless and identifies the spirit and matter. As with the individual, so with the universal love, all that widening of the self through its sympathy, goodwill, universal benevolence and beneficence, love of mankind, love of creatures, the attraction of all the forms and presences that surround us, by which mentally and emotionally man escaped to the first limits of his ego, has to be taken up into a unifying divine love for the universal divine. So now he is coming to the second point. First we have seen is the individual attraction to the divine and attraction that begins to an idol or an ideal or a person or a personality. And as we said, love, loving any of these individual things is the first step towards widening oneself. In fact, the very fact of marriage, the very fact of having children, the very fact of this expands your ego. Otherwise, you are very selfish. The teenager is all the time selfish, thinking of himself. The teenager girl or the boy. You see, up to, up to that time, it is all selfishness. But then there is a slowly and naturally an attraction for the other. So don't be surprised when your daughter or son in adolescent age start loving a girlfriend or a boyfriend. It's natural because the selfishness starts opening up. It becomes something for the other. You see, nature has such a beautiful natural movement. Why is it that the moment that our son and daughter become you know, young enough, we say get married? It's not just a social security, we have given it a kind of social rule and all that. But from nature's evolutionary point of view, that's a step in self-widening. Then you have children, 
again the horizon widens, the ego widens. You are no more husband and wife, you are children. That means your horizon has widened. You have learned to live, love the third person, not the fourth person. And then after that, you love to, you begin to love your community. So there is all the time a kind of a widening. And so in this, all that widening of the self through sympathy, goodwill, universal benevolence and beneficence, love of mankind. It is in this gesture of widening that we have sympathy, goodwill, universal benevolence, love of mankind. So we have all the societies and communities and social activities and all that and churches and you know, ashrams and all that. What is happening? You are widening yourself. See, we have never looked at our society from this angle. We thought there should be marriage as an institution, we should have this an institution to protect the society, the four levels of society, Brahmacharya, Grihastha and all that. But have you never seen from the point of view of spirituality? From the point of view of spirituality, all these ashramas, Brahmacharya, Grihastha and Vanapastha and Sanyasa, is a widening of one's consciousness. You see, that is the beautiful thing. So it becomes, you know, mandatory, almost obligatory for every man and woman to get married. You know, it's not an absolute law by itself, but it is a natural way. So there's nothing wrong in getting married and getting have children and all that. It is a wideness. But the only thing is, if we get stuck on the vital physical level, on the level of the Grihastha Ashrama, then there is something wrong. We need to go beyond, beyond the Grihastha into the Vanaprastha, from the Vanaprastha into the Sannyasa. How many of us can do that? That is the whole problem. We get married, we have children, we have property, we have this thing, then we have our grandchildren in America or Australia and then Vanaprastha we never come to. We get arrested in this life. So that is why Shivam is telling all this is good, has its place. Because this is the first step of the widening of the consciousness. Adoration fulfilled in love, love in ananda, the surpassing love, the self-wrapped ecstasy of transcendent delight in the transcendent which awaits us at the end of the path of devotion has for its wider result a universal love for all beings, the ananda of all that is. We perceive behind every veil the divine spiritually embrace in all forms the all beautiful. You see, adoration fulfilled in love and love in ananda. That's the summary of the thing. You adore to the extent it turns into love. So when we say you love the mother, how do you do that? You have to adore her first. You have to admire. You see, if you think, oh, Mother and Shwam, the what big thing they have done, nothing to admire. See, admiration is something mental I can imagine. But that is why we need to read them, their life, their work, their works, their, their books. Because then we start begin to admire. We go to ashramas, we go to this person's lecture. And we say, wow, beautiful, admirable. But then constantly if you start admiring the person, it gets into adoration. So if you want to love the mother, get to know her, admire her. See what mother should have not done. Don't just think, no, no, I'm a bad house, I will start loving the mother. Because that's what I say, you have to do something for the person whom you want to love. The first stage is admiration or first the initial stage is recognition, <coughs> admire. How will you admire? By knowing their works, what they have said, the way they have said, what they have done in their own life. Then slowly this admiration turns into adoration. Then you start doing the puja, then you start worshipping because this adoration of the heart is the real love. So, on the level of adoration is born the love for the mother. 
and the love for the mother, love for Shravindo will take you to the Ananda, the divine ecstasy. You see even in this devotion there are so many stages. So you now you can see at what stage you are, admiration, adoration, love and Ananda. So you see this is such pragmatic thing that Shravindo is telling us what to do, when to do, why to do. If I say, no, I am just, I can't even admire the mother, there are a lot of people, I have seen in Auroville and here and there, they don't even know anything about the mother. Yes, Aurobindo, Sri Aurobindo, we know that he is the founder of an ashram. What have you read about him? Nothing. Do you know what work he has done? Nothing. So, the first mental recognition, if it does not come, where will the admiration come? You just heard the name of Sri and the mother, but what have they done for humanity, for themselves, for you and me? If you don't read, you will never understand, or you have to go to Sakar to get to listen to some lectures. But if you don't come to Sakar, also you will not know anything. So, what I want to say is recognize, admire, adore, love, ananda. So, this is how it increases. So friends, everything we have to increase is an evolution, it is a process. So do not just say I love the mother and sit back on your sofa in your armchair. We have to progress in all these things. So a universal delight in his endless manifestation flows through us, taking in its search every form and movement, but not bound or stationary in any and always reaching out to a greater and more perfect expression. This universal love is liberative and dynamic for transformation, for the discord of forms and appearances ceases to affect the heart that has felt the one truth behind them all and understood their perfect significance. You see, there is this growth of the universality. You see, why is it that we are saying you love everything that the Divine has created? Because from the individual consciousness, one has to get a universal consciousness. And to help in this universal consciousness, we have, you know, altruism, we have philanthropy, we are helping each other, we have sympathy for the others. But all these are only steps until you reach that point of the universal divine. And uh, this universal love is liberative and dynamic for transformation. You see, in their own life of Mother and Shwabindo, you see this extraordinary element of universality. You see the prayers and meditations? I mean, you cannot believe Mother in, in that 1912, 19, in her early age. She had already such a tremendous universal consciousness. She is never asking anything for herself. Read the prayers all the time, earth, mankind, humanity, this universe. Have you ever seen the mother asking for anything for herself? All of the prayers are meditation, nothing. If there is anything, she says, Lord, may I be an instrument in getting thy peace to the world. Not for her benefit, her progress, her, her spirituality, nothing. And then Sri of course, you see that there is never an I in him. There is always the humanity, always mankind. So the, the greatness of these two persons is already there in the very steps that we recognize them. The moment we go to them, we say, my God, they are huge universal beings. He is not just a mother in Pondicherry or in Paris. He is not just Shwabindo sitting here in Pondicherry. There is the universality. Never have they done anything for themselves. Shwabindo said, I am not bringing Superman for myself. I could have gotten, if it is for myself, I could have gotten Superman long back. All the time the universe, the humanity, the world, I mean every breath they had, the breath was that of mankind. So this was the beauty. So we see the impartial equality of soul of the selfless worker and nor is transformed in the magic touch of divine love into an all-embracing ecstasy and million-bodied beatitude. 
all things become bodies and all movements the playthings of the divine beloved in his infinite house of pleasure even pain is changed and in the reactions and even in the essence things painful alter the forms of pain fall away there are created in their place the forms of ananda beautiful I mean in this universality what comes is the impartial equality of soul of the selfless worker and nor is transformed by the magic touch of divine love this is a beautiful step you see understand now the more universal you become the more you can spread the divine love how we have already seen that if you love the divine you have to love divine's own creation so the more you love i know when i say divine's creation it was incredible to think of an incident somebody says shravanda for some time used to prepare you know take out the bones from the fish to give the to give to his cats in his house there are a couple of cats so he spent time to take away the bones of the fish and gave that beautiful fish to the uh, to the cat so you see a man a person who is bothered with the superman has also that much love for a little cat do we do that at home take out the bones I mean, it is a magnificent example of a or shravanda writes you know in one of his poem the hand that sent jupiter spinning through heaven spends all its cunning to fashion a curl and that's poetry but this is reality the man who sits like the shiva in his in his chamber you have all seen shravanda's room in that sofa he sits like the shiva pulling down the sofa mind and the same shiva shravanda feeds a cat incredible that's the the real universal consciousness so here it says that impartial equality of soul of the selfless worker is transformed with the magic touch of the divine love into all embracing ecstasy and million bodied beatitude so the mother and shiva they just started loving the little cat the little dog i mean there are instances when you read how the dogs used to run to shravanda's room they used to take their newborn babies to them i mean they also started responding so this is this million bodied beatitude all things become bodies and all move into play things of the divine beloved in his infinite house of pleasure i mean this only one who has experience can really tell us this once you are in that universal consciousness there is a tremendous greatness of love the divine love and everything becomes a thing of beauty joy of ananda to the extent even even pain is transformed there is nothing called pain be it the physical or the vital or the mental when shivananda had this accident as all of you know he broke his thigh bone he was lying in his in, in between the room and the hall doctors were panicky and they, they wanted to do this and that but shravanda says that was an experience of ananda for me he didn't feel the pain in his legs so all things so called painful turn into forms of ananda if one is in that great consciousness this is in its essence the nature of the change of consciousness which turns existence itself into a glorified field of a divine love and ananda in its essence it begins for the seeker when he passes from the ordinary to the spiritual level and looks with a new heart of luminous vision and feeling on the world and self and others it reaches its height when the spiritual becomes also the supramental level and there also it is possible not only to feel it in essence but realize it dynamically as a power for the transformation of the whole inner life and the whole outer existence well we will uh, take it up uh, continue with the next para what is this essence of the change of consciousness we have understood now from the individual you move to the universal from the universal you move to the level of a divine love 
and with that divine love your entire life becomes transformed not only you but you begin to see the divinity in all things around and this seeing or this experience reaches its finale when there is a supramental because you see there could be a great rishi saying i also see the divine everything in everything that is around me i also see my atman but can you change the outer can you transform the physical into immortality no rishis have lived 300 years 400 years but they died they had to leave the body but a body can be immortal everything can be changed only with the coming of the superman of course when he wrote that superman had not yet come in so is i think when the superman will come but now reading this we know superman has already come in 1956 it is not altogether difficult for the mind to envisage even though it may be difficult for the human will with its many earth earth tries to accept this transformation of the spirit and nature of love from the character of a mixed and limited human emotion to a supreme and all embracing divine passion it is when we come to the works of love that a certain perplexity is likely to intervene now as we are discussed with the with the sacrifice of knowledge that when we wanted to seek the divine there were different attitudes some people said all this world is full of misery let us become ascetics some people said no it is an illusion some philosophers said no let us accept so it says even when you love the divine this is what happens there are possibilities of a different interpretation but before i take up the classification i have something here from the mother and she explained this sentence which we have already read where it says for there is concealed behind individual love obscured by the ignorant human figure a mystery which the mind cannot see the mystery of the body of the divine that line our mother is explaining I mean, I want to read out uh, that explanation from this uh, the synthesis of yoga. This is, as I said, volume seven or eight of the Mother's collected works. Maybe this is most probably from volume eight. So, when he is speaking about the the flute player and the all beautiful, the Mother explains. This brings us back to the symbol of Krishna and Radha. Krishna is the one of whom Sri Aurobindo speaks here, the divine flute player. That is to say, the immanent and universal divine, who is the supreme power of attraction, and the soul, the psychic personality called here Radha, who responds to the call of the flute player. So, who is Radha? She is not just an outer figure. She is the soul, the psychic being. why is radha attracted to sri krishna so much the truth the spiritual truth is radha is the psychic within us and then krishna is this personality who is immanent and universal and krishna is the divine universal and radha is the psychic being so the psychic being within us is constantly attracted to loving the universal divine so it is that spiritual truth that is given in radha and krishna and not the so called so mythology there is a radha krishna radha panting and you know crying for all that but all that is only symbolic that how much the psychic being longs to see the divine so it is uh, we have never seen rukmini longing for uh, shri krishna because rukmini does not represent the psychic being it is radha who represents so he says so i have been asked to say something this evening on the radha consciousness that is in fact on the way in which the individual soul answers the soul of the call of the divine it so happens that this is exactly what shri aurobindo has described in the chapter we have just read 
It is that capacity of finding ananda in all things through identification with the one divine presence and the complete self-giving to that presence. So I don't think I have much to add. What I could say would be a limitation or a diminution of the totality of this experience. After a silence, this consciousness has the capacity of changing everything into a perpetual ecstasy. For instead of seeing things in their discordant appearance, one can now see only the divine presence, the divine will and the grace everywhere. And every event, every element, every circumstance, every form changes into a way, a detail through which one can draw more intimately and profoundly closer to the divine. <coughs> Discordances disappear, ugliness vanishes. There is now only the splendor of the, of the divine presence in a love shining in all things. That is what we did discuss, that once we had this psychic touch, then why is it that all our saints and sages, they always say, realize your Atman? The thing is, once we start living in the inner being, our entire way of looking at the world changes. You see, there is no more discordance, there is no more disharmony, and as, he puts, as she puts it here, there is no more ugliness, there is no more enemy, there is no more dushmani, there is no more other. Because the, the realization of the Atman, the first experience is of course of love, love for the divine, love for humanity. And perhaps I can say the second dominant experience is that of unity. So what is the experience of, love, of psychic being if you want to gauge yourself that you, am I really having any psychic contact? You can judge yourself by seeing how much you are loving the others, other human beings, other creatures, other animals and also how much of unity, the sense of unity you have with everybody. So love and unity are the, are the qualifications of a psychic contact. If you have hatred for the people, if you have division for the people, if you have no unity for the others, then you know he is not yet the psychic being. You may have a great love, a great companion, but if you just hate some people, some religions, others, you know surely you are not in the psychic consciousness. Because those are the two signals of a psychic being, of an Atman consciousness. So it is obvious that from a practical point of view, one must be able to remain at a constant and unshakable height in order to be in that state without exposing oneself to fairly troublesome consequence. This is probably why those who wish to live in this state use to withdraw from the world and find the universal contact through nature. I must say, without meaning to be unpleasant to men, that it is infinitely easier to realize this, this state of consciousness when one is surrounded by trees and flowers and plants and even animals than by human beings. I mean, I hope you understand the little dig at the human beings. You see, why did people withdraw to the forest? Because it is much easier to have a universal consciousness looking at nature. So there's the butterflies and animals and deers and sometimes tigers and the fruits. But when you come to the human society, when you live here, you are constantly at loggerheads. There is constantly jagada, there is constantly conflict. And everybody pricks your ego, pricks your consciousness. But there a passing uh, a rabbit doesn't prick your ego. So you feel so good and so universal and you see you know, I become a sadhu, you start growing a beard and a long hair and put a rocker close. My sadhu sannyas ban gaya, kyo? You know, I have no hatred for anybody. I, have, I love the rabbit, I love the flower, I love the tiger. But mother would say, you come back to society and I will give you three days time. In these three days, see how many times you get pricked by your ego. So that is the test of your, of your growth. The moment you come back, your friends say, hey, yaar, kya ho gaya? you have become darkish. So what? I was so pure and I have become dark. Immediately your image changes. 
hey where have you been you know your your family is doing like that oh my god why did my family suffer your emotion so you shrink back into your individuality so mother would say it's much easier to go nature to become a sadhak there than to live in humanity that's why shravana yoga is so difficult you be here you be in the society you be constantly you know pricked by people comments admiration gala gali and then you remain still untouched tab hui baat that you are somebody going to nature and the himalayas is easy you know nobody to prick you nobody to say you are a damn fool but here every child will say you are a damn fool so the sadhana in the world is the real test of your sadhana and that's why shoham the integral yoga is not so easy we have to be here in the muck in the dirt in the filth and yet we are lotus that's the real lotus or a bindu to be the integral yogi so she says it's easy to be a sadhak in the nature if one wants the state to be truly integral one must be able to keep it at every moment in the presence of anyone and anything there are countless legends or stories of this kind like that of prallad for instance which we saw recently in a film stories which illustrate the state of consciousness and i am not only convinced but i myself have the quite tangible experience that if in the presence of some danger or an enemy or some ill will you are able to remain in this condition and see the divine in all things well the danger will have no effect the ill will can do nothing to you and the enemy will either be transformed or run away that's quite certain so be a sadhak here in this society among the human beings that will prove your your status of consciousness and at the same time it will help the others because you are transmitting your spiritual consciousness so to be here and to be a sadhak helps you and the society but if you become a sadhak in the mountains the lion and the tiger and the deer are not going to be sadhaks it's the human beings who will be influenced so the integral yoga proposes this kind of a sadhana here and now because it's a mutual help for growth the society reflects how much you have become a sadhak if there is an ill will if there is an anger if there is a passion if there is so that shows that you are not yet reached a high consciousness but when you reach that high consciousness nobody can prick your ego you will not be affected you will not be pulled down so uh, so but i must add a word which is quite important you must not seek the state of consciousness with any motive or seek it because it's a protection or a help you must have it sincerely spontaneously constantly it must be a normal natural effortless way of being then it is effective but if you try in the least to imitate the movement with the idea of obtaining a particular result it won't succeed the result is not obtained at all and then in your ignorance you will perhaps say oh but they told me that it's not true that's because there was some insincerity somewhere otherwise if you are really sincere that is if it is an integral and spontaneous experience it's all powerful if looking into somebody's eyes you can spontaneously see the divine presence there the worst movements vanish the worst obstacles disappear and the flame of an infinite joy awakes sometimes in the person in the other person as well as in yourself if on the other person if in the other person there is a least possibility or just a tiny rift in his ill will the flame shines forth well of course uh, you have understood this you see that's why the mother would say don't do yoga with any motivation because some people want to do yoga to get power some people to have good health some people to have control over others if you do yoga with any kind of motivation you will not be able to succeed so you have to do yoga only for the sake of the divine you want the divine and nothing else not any other motivation should be there 
getting wealth or health or popularity or fame or becoming a guru. Yeah, I think that's the worst thing one can think of. I mean, doing yoga in order to become a guru after five years, then you know where you are. I mean, Gharkana Ghatke, you will be nobody. So she says, please don't do anything for the sake of your individual. What she says, you know, to gain a power. It must be a very spontaneous thing. I'm living for the divine. I want the divine. I want to have union with the divine. Agar usme in the process, if we gain some powers given by the divine, is yours. But if you, even if you don't get powers, you don't say, hey, that fellow did five years and I did for ten years and mujhe kuch nahi hai, unka powers hai. That means ill-motivated. So there cannot be any of these motives here. There's one letter, a, letter, a short one, I'd like to read that before we leave. Sweet mother, about Radha in all the Vaishnavite stories and in the accounts of many mystics, there are always tears and anguish. She wept and the divine did not come. The divine tormented her. What does this mean? She was integral purity, then why? You know, I mean, you must know, all of you know this very well, you know. Radha's Viraha. I think you know so many songs, you know. Radha's Viraha, Kitna Gana Gara And poor Krishna is not coming, and we all feel pity that what is this Krishna? Yeah, she's crying last 22 hours. and So we feel that why isn't that this divine responding? Even to Radha, who is supposed to be the real pure thing. Mother is just laughing away, says, this is just on the way. That happens when one is still on the way, when one has not reached the goal. They have that. They insist a lot in this. This for, for they like to prolong the human road simply because they enjoy the human road and because as I told you, if you want to remain in life, in contact with life, a certain relativity necessarily remains in the experience. They like it this way. They like to quarrel with the divine. They like the feeling of separation. These things give them pleasure for they remain in the human consciousness and want to remain there. You see, all this, uh, with all the due respect to those great poets who wrote about uh, that Jayadev's, what is that uh, great? Gita Govind. Gita Govind. You have all read that. So, what is the tremendous, you know, crying and this and beating that. So she says all this, you know, Gita Govind is supposed to be a great poem, you know, full of imagery and symbolism. And most people don't understand Gita Govind because they take it wrongly. They think it's a physical relation between Radha and Krishna. Radha tying up his uh, uh, things on the... You know, first of all, it is given in such a way that most people would like to drag it down to their own vital pleasure. There's nothing to do with that. And on the spiritual level also, Mother is saying, this kind of a viraha and separation and crying for each other is because human beings want, you know, we kind of paint the divine relation in a human color. So because maybe Bibi Saduru, Dasdin Kale, you know, there's a viraha, there's an SMS, there's a telephone call. We want to have the same thing between Radha and Krishna. It is a projection of your human way. It says it's not true. So this question of a viraha between Radha and Krishna doesn't exist. But we have humanized because we find great pleasure in that. Dekho bhai, ye bhi viraha mein thi. So she says, the moment there is perfect identification, all this disappears. Really, Radha and Krishna are identified. They don't have this separation and viraha and the songs and bhajans and, you know, your great mythology and dances. And I'm sorry, I mean, the dancer should not take it ill. You can still go on dancing on Radha's vida. But it's all public entertainment. But spirituality, she says, those who are identified will not have all this separation and all this crying and all that. So it is as though one were depriving oneself of the pleasure of a drama. <laughs> There's something that has gone out of life that is its illusion. They still need a reasonable amount of illusion. They can't enter directly into the truth. You see, Mother and Shravindo don't mix issues. So spirituality is this. If you want drama and entertainment and you know, sort of masti karna ko, 
राधा कृष्ण में डांस करो विरा करो एंड ऑल दैट बट इस इज नथिंग टू डू विद स्पिरिचुअलिटी इज ऑल ह्यूमन ड्रामा यू पीपल लाइक इट विदाउट इट यू नो दर वेन इट डांसेस टुमारो एंड विदाउट डांसेस वेर वी लिव इन द इवनिंग खाली घर में बैठना एंड यू नो एंड सामबडी के नॉट लिव और इंटरनेशनल गेस्ट हाउस इसे दादा कथा जाओ वो सारे दिन बाड़ी पर बस आते सो वी नीड टू कम आउट सो वी नीड दिस डांसेस सो वी नीड दिस विराहस वी नीड टू सो मदर सेज गो ऑन आई हैव नो ऑब्जेक्शन बट इफ यू वांट टू कम टू मी एज अ स्पिरिचुअल थिंग दिस इज अ डिफरेंट स्टोरी सो व्हाट वी आर ट्राइंग टू से इज spirituality you can have all these things you can have all the dramas all the geeta govinds but let us be very clear with one thing that all these are steps on the way never think these are the finale these are things that help you to grow but if you think these are the be all and the end all you are stuck but as human consciousness is at different level and it grows you can take help of all these things at different levels but only be clear that this is only momentary growth i mean momentary help i will go beyond that because to reach the soul to reach the inner being takes a long journey but at least let us have the aim that's the target i may reach it in this life or next life doesn't matter but at least what the mother and shrubin have done is they have awakened us to our aim my aim is not to become rich my aim is not to become popular my aim is not to reach is to get money but ma my aim is to come to you whatever way i may get the beatings and the hootings and the and the love and this but ma only take me to you the track may be long the track may be short but if if i can fix the target in this life I've done already great things. How many? How far you have gone to that? It may take you one life, ten life, twenty lives, but it matters not, because as you said, once you turn to me and say, "Ma, I love you," I'm responsible for you not only in this life, but for all lives to come. So just say, "Ma, I love you, and I want you, nothing else." And it may be very momentary. Next minute, you have this rasagulla. You may take rasagulla and, and samosa. But at least have this deep call. Let's have the concentration.